Hello and welcome back to Big Discussions. My name is Dr. Anwar Youssef Dunbar. I am the owner and the creator of this channel and I'm also the owner and the creator of the Big Words blog site. Uh, my blogs, URL, and all of my social media are in the banner uh, for my channel. Um, if you'd like to go take a look around, uh, actually please go take a look around at the blog. Uh, as there are, uh, there's a ton of content over there from, you know, everything ranging from education to science to money to technology to some social discussions, interviews of all kinds. So there's a lot of stuff over there. Uh, but more importantly, I'm trying to grow this channel. So uh, please like, share, and subscribe. Uh, the, the more subscribers I get, the more, uh, the more this will grow. And I think I have some cool messages here. Uh, today, oh. If you hear uh, some piano in the background, if, if you hear a piano in the background, uh, that's not me. Uh, my downstairs neighbor is a pianist, and she's and she practices regularly, and her students come over regularly. So I'm I'm treated to uh, concerts and recitals uh, all the time here. Um, today is February twenty fourth, two thousand nineteen. Uh, we're towards the end of uh, Black History Month, um, and I've I've created uh, lots of content here on my channel regarding Black History Month, and I've also uh, created uh, numerous blog posts over on my uh, blog for Black History Month. Um, but when I was thinking about what Vlogcast Nine would be, I realized that I didn't want to get too far away from my core messages. And one of my uh, core messages is, is awareness of the STEMs, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And I think that um, one of my major contributions is telling my STEM story, uh, particularly for, for kids like me um, from backgrounds like my own. Um, if you go to my blog, I wrote up several high-level uh, blog posts about pharmacology and toxicology and admin slash drug metabolism and in inhalation toxicology, and I even wrote one up about regulatory science. Uh, I had a former colleague and a peer uh, before I published those read over those to make sure everything was accurate and and you know, uh, accurate. And I think uh, him and, and some other uh, colleagues didn't really understand what I was doing and why I was writing those up. And this particular colleague said, we should start an online college course to teach college kids. And I think he looked at what I was doing and he was saying, okay, well, we should figure out how to get paid, which is something uh, Everyone should be thinking about. Everyone should be thinking about multiple streams of income. Um, but I think he was looking at this as a cash grab. And what I was thinking of was how I could disseminate this information to again to kids and families from backgrounds like my own. So I, I think that when there's a need, uh, sometimes you do what's necessary to address that need. Uh, there's data showing that. Uh, less than 10% of STEM degree holders are black slash African American. So my people, for whatever reason, uh, lag behind, uh, or should I say don't participate very much in the STEM fields. So I think part of my mission, and part of my passion is spreading awareness of these fields and telling my STEM stories. So there's a need there. So sometimes you do things, even if you don't, I believe you do things sometimes, even if you're not gonna get paid right away, or even if maybe you don't get paid at all, but the fact that the point is to pull up others, use what you've been given and use what you've been blessed with to pull up others. So that's why I do what I do and that's one of the reasons why I'm here doing this. So I do, um, I wanna tell my STEM story a little bit. So I do uh, career fairs when I can and I do career days when I can. Um, and one of the questions I get quite a bit from peers and from, other, from parents is how do I get my child involved in the sciences or what can I do? Um, so 
you know, I want to I want to talk about that. So the question is, in this instance, how does how did a kid from Buffalo's East Side get to a PhD program at the University of Michigan, finish it, uh, uh, f finish his PhD in pharmacology, then get extra training in toxicology uh, at the Wadsworth Center, and then settle into the public sector as a regulatory scientist? How does how does that happen? So I want to talk about that, but I want to focus in this vlogcast on the beginning because the beginning is is very very important and maybe the, the most important part of the journey um so i want to start by saying that i didn't really have any i didn't have any stem professionals in my family uh i had a cousin who was a medical doctor over on my father's side but i didn't really talk to this person much until i got older so i didn't have any stem professionals on my mother's side um and a lot of black families were like that um Let's see, the first science class I remember uh, was taught by a woman named Miss Eva Doyle, who, um, you, you know, who's very passionate about black history. So uh, if, if you go to Buffalo and you see Miss Doyle now, she's very um, synonymous with uh, passing on black history, and she's done a lot of work there. Uh, but I remember Miss Doyle in the, in the second grade, I believe, teaching us about the Great Plains. So she taught us, she taught me some early lessons on uh, geography and I remember as a young child wondering what the difference was between these great planes and actual airplanes um, and I don't really have any other memories of science until the seventh grade when I uh, started uh, my life sciences class and in a nutshell life sciences uh, is beginners uh, biology so we started learning about living things. Um, and as you can see here, I'm holding up a model of a DNA double helix. Now before I get into life science, I want to say here that models are uh, very valuable and uh, effective teaching tools for young people. So I've, because I do career days and, and uh, STEM career fairs, I've slowly started to build up my collection of uh, uh, models and, and toys, as you can see with this one and these cells uh, over here. So my uh, seventh grade uh, life sciences class, and I don't think it's, it's, you know, it's 30 years later, so I don't think this person will mind if I mention his name, uh, but my teacher was a man named Mr. Rademacher, and this was at the Campus West College Learning Laboratory on the campus of Buffalo State College. Those of you from Buffalo who know, know what that is, that's my mom's alma mater. Um, and uh, Mr. Rademacher uh, was a very enthusiastic and uh, creative teacher. Uh, Mr. Rademacher gave me my first lessons in uh, taxonomy. So that is how living things are classified. So, uh, you know, there's an animal kingdom, for example, and there's a plant kingdom. Um, and, you know, once you classify something as an animal, then you can go all the way down and classify a species. So you go from kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Mr. Rademacher taught us that. But he had a very creative way of getting us to remember it. And so he came up with this thing called, um, that went, king, pudding head, choose on fairy green spiders. So he came up with a whole set of different terms to, to get us to remember kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And I remember that 30 years later, and that's a testament to how good a teacher, uh, how effective a teacher he was. Uh, Mr. Rademacher gave me my first lessons on cell biology and the differences between, I'm sorry, the differences between uh, an animal cell and a plant cell. Uh, a plant cell has a cell wall. It has chlorophyll because the plant performs photosynthesis. An animal cell doesn't have a cell wall. It doesn't have chlorophyll. So Mr. Rademacher taught me that for the first time. Um, Mr. Rademacher taught us about everything that was in a cell. Um, a nucleus where which houses the DNA, you know, a mitochondria, 
uh, you know, a, a vacuole, you know, the cytoplasm, all these different things he taught us. He, I, I remember learning about how plants reproduce. Uh, in this instance, you know, insects fly around, they get covered in pollen and they transfer the pollen to another flower and, and, and that's how the flower uh, creates a fruit and the plant reproduces that way. So there was the combination of a really good teacher and I had an interest in this stuff. It wasn't hard for me to learn and it just resonated with me and it stimulated me. So learning it wasn't, wasn't difficult for me. Um, and, and that's important. You know, the next year I learned, um, the next year in eighth grade, I uh, uh, had physical science, which is beginner's physics. And it was very different. I didn't understand what was going on. And it was kind of, it, it was kind of dry. Um, and that uh, was due to the person teaching it. And I'm not knocking the person teaching it. Um, but I struggled in high school physics as well, and that was very dry. So there's, there's a, a, a nice counterbalance between the person teaching the subject and the actual uh, subject. I, I followed my older brother to Hutch Tech High School in Buffalo. It was a technical high school, and we had to choose majors. So because I enjoyed life science so much, I... Uh, chose to major in biotechnology, which was basically AP biology, you know. So uh, by my senior year, we were learning about uh, the micromolecules in a cell and the macromolecules and uh, some other, other nuances. And we were also uh, uh, learning, we, we'd also done some dissections and some things like that. And uh, I ultimately followed that love for biology into undergrad and then into grad school, as I discussed. Um, but the start was critical, and I didn't know what I was going to do with that. I didn't figure it out until almost 15, 20 years later, but the start was critical, and that's because I had an affinity for the subject matter, and I had an, a very effective teacher. I don't recall being involved in any uh, science fairs where I was competing against other kids at a young age. Uh, but again, I just had an affinity for this subject matter. Now, what's also important is the home environment. You know, again, as I discussed in my very first vlogcast, uh, I come from a home where education was encouraged um, and curiosity was encouraged. And there was an environment there where we could sit and think and ponder things and, and ask questions. Me and my brother were also very much into science fiction, so we were always watching Star Wars and Star Trek and Battlestar Galactica and Buck Rogers and all, you know, all kinds of things. So we were always thinking about, I was always thinking about outer space and, and those kinds of things. Um, it's different for every kid. Um, if you go to my blog, I interviewed a former classmate from the University of Michigan's Department of Pharmacology, Dr. Naman J. Bumpus, uh, who is now a researcher at the Johns Hopkins University and a very talented one. She's still doing research. Um, in her interview, uh, Dr. Bumpus uh, talked about how her family saw her interest in science and invested in chemistry sets. So, uh, she at a young age she was playing around with chemistry sets and then she was even curious enough to uh, look professors up online and go ask them questions. I also interviewed uh, Dr. Vernon Morris, uh, a peer over at Howard University in the Department of Chemistry. And Dr. Morris uh, is very um, active in terms of going out into the DC public schools and doing science demonstrations there, uh, which is very important. I, I, I do stuff with him sometimes. And he told me in our interview, my interview with him, that I believe he went away and did camps, science camps, when he was younger. So there are all kinds of things that can foster this love and, and, and encourage someone to get into uh, a given science career. A good teacher helps, an affinity for the material helps, uh, an investment by the family helps and also talking to STEM professionals helps. So um, 
if you don't have anyone in your immediate family, if you're watching this and you have questions for me and if I can answer questions for you, feel free to leave a comment or contact me uh, through my blog information or, or via um, social media. As I close this, I, I want to say that while it's important to encourage uh, minority participation in the STEMs, um, I believe that we shouldn't do things just for the money. So I do believe that we all have natural gifts and inclinations. Some students are more inclined in the arts, some are more inclined in the humanities, some are more inclined in business, while others are more inclined in the STEMs. But I think the critical thing is to present the possibility and the opportunity. Um, so that's, that's, that's critical. It's the presenting of the opportunity. The other thing is that um, in terms of my core audience and in terms of who's watching this, some messages are meant to hit the, the first person watching it and then some messages are meant to trickle out through whoever the viewer is. So if you um, know of a young person who's interested in the sciences, uh, please take some of this information that I presented here, put it to good use, or again, ask, leave a comment and feel free to ask me uh, questions. Um, lastly, uh, planetariums, if you have a planetarium in your area, those are very valuable platforms for fostering a love for science. Uh, I am a, a board member for the Friends of the David M. Brown Arlington Planetarium, uh, which is in Arlington, Virginia. Uh, so if you live in the D.C. metro area, or what we call the DMV, uh, please look us up. I will leave our website in the description box. Uh, we have shows once a month. We have speakers from NASA and from the major observatories and from some um, uh, space aerospace companies. We have lecturers coming in all the time from these, these groups. Um, and planetariums are really good ways for young people to sit and think and ponder science and ponder uh, outer space. This particular weekend in uh, February 2019, we focused on Charles Darwin, who was known for evolution. And um, so we deviated just a little bit from uh, astronomy and uh, uh, astrophysics and, and outer space, and we focused more on life. And, and planetariums are also uh, very uh, entertaining venues for adults as well. But again, these are, it's a fun way for kids to start thinking and wondering about science. And it's the thinking and the wondering, no matter which science you get into, which is the most important part. Taking it back to pharmacology, you know, any drug or therapy that's created, uh, you have to first understand the science. You have to understand how the, the cells work. You have to understand how the tissue works. You have to understand how the body works. And understanding how those work, it all starts with questions. It all starts with critical thought and creative thought. And with that, I will uh, conclude this vlogcast. Thank you for stopping by. Please like, share, and subscribe. And um, reach out to me via social media if you have any questions or comments. And with that, I will conclude, and I will see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.